Hi, I'm Bill Hosley. In 1980, I got a summer job right out of school at Wadsworth Athenaeum as research assistant to the chief curator who was writing a catalog of their Wallace Nutting collection. No one measures this stuff, but Wallace Nutting was arguably one of the hundred most famous people in America in the 1920s, hence the idea of a Nutting era. Rural New England. Wallace Nutting's personal papers are mostly lost. No one has studied his background thoroughly. His father died in the Civil War when he was a baby. He was raised by a single mother in a village he liked to remember as Rock Bottom, a village in the town of Stowe, Massachusetts, a town then with a population of about 1,500. They later moved to a small farming community in inland Maine. How he wound up at Exeter and Harvard is beyond me. He always had an oratorical streak, wanted to be a clergyman, a then prestigious occupation, the most prestigious in early America. He finished his formal education at Hartford Divinity School in the, at the time, 1880s, when Hartford was the center of an emerging antiques industry. He served churches in Seattle and Providence, Rhode Island before having what was apparently a nervous breakdown. He was known to have pioneered the three-ring circus approach to church life, doing everything all the time. He hungered to be the influencer he became. In his autobiography, he wrote about being low status at Harvard. His doctor told him he better live on the sod or live under it, which in 1901 was perfectly aligned with the then roaring country life movement. He took up photography and cycling as therapy. This camera belonged to him and is at the Framingham, Massachusetts Historical Society, where the Nuttings lived after their adventure farming in Connecticut. In 1906, he and his wife, Marriott, bought a farm in Southbury, Connecticut, centered around an 18th century house he christened Nuttingham. The next six years would be the most transformative of his life. By 1912, when they relocated to Framingham, he had established a national reputation as an art photographer and champion of early America. It's also when he caught the bug for antiques. Over the next decade, he became a renowned expert on early American antiques. Indeed, the whole idea of antiques. Nutting, who described himself as a poet capitalist with a love of the beautiful, became, in fact, a phenomenal entrepreneur first by figuring out how to turn his photography into a livelihood. In 1911, Country Life in America, then one of the most popular magazines, published a major article about him titled The New Mission of an Old Farmhouse, which opened by stating that on the outskirts of the little village of Southbury lives a man with a camera who's doing two very remarkable things. He's creating a permanent photographic record of days that are fast vanishing, and he is successfully maintaining a genuine community of craftsmen and craftswomen in the country. He built a pond, arranged landscape vistas, and placed sheep up his hills. This home became a stage for his quiet photographic dramas, using an entire collection bought in Hartford. The whole place bears evidence of the loving hand of an antiquarian and artist. As the business grew, Nutting had the huge old barn rebuilt into a studio, and community house where office workers, shippers, mounters, assemblers, and 20-odd trained colorists work together and live together in dormitory rooms, all perfectly consistent with the art colony movement then raging. This picture of Nutting taken in those years is one of only a handful of portraits known, taken before the fireplace in Southbury. Nutting had a kind of genius for marketing and promotion right out of the box that is not incompatible with church work. He is said to have been a pioneer of what they call the three ring circus approach to church management with lots going on. He was always a workaholic. He wasn't the only one to hand color black and white photographs in the age before color photography, but he made the art famous and quickly developed a national market reportedly with tens of millions sold. These were his Southbury colorists, young ladies often off the farm, who lived in a communal setting on the grounds of Nuttingham. Their days were spent following rigorously prescribed directions for coloring the prints. Some doubled as models for his photographic dramas. Although he started out photographing New England country life and scenery, 
On rainy days and in winter, he began to stage the colonial interiors that made him famous. This is at Nottingham and includes early examples of Marriott Nutting's hooked rugs. Not a period detail, but the rest is meant to convey a sense of being inside an 18th century home in the years before colonial Williamsburg or old Sturbridge Village. Marriott Griswold Nutting grew up in the Griswold House in Buckland, Mass., a location surrounded by apple orchards. It's there that Nutting got the bug. Nutting gave his pictures poetic names. Decked like a bride is one of his most popular. Nutting photos were common bridal gifts in the teens and 20s, and by the 1920s, every stationery store and department store across the country sold Nutting photographs. He joked about the difficulty of getting cows to pose. The Southbury estate included a range of farm animals, which became part of his stage sets for the real business of the farm, making art. Monarchs of the Forest is what he called his tree pictures of the stately elms we've lost for a public nostalgic for country life. Historic houses initially within miles of Southbury were abundant. Angling for new markets and new ways to burnish his brand and reputation, in 1912 Nutting published his first book, Old New England Pictures. Apparently only 200 copies were made. Rare today, it's a book of his finest hand-colored interiors accompanied by impressionistic text. They are the gold standard of nutting photography and mark his emergence as an author, the first of about 25 books and catalogs over the next 25 years. The staging, furnishings, models in period dress and impeccable coloring, these are masterpieces of his genre of art. This close-up illustrates the painstaking colorization and details of these compositions. Nutting had a curatorial and design talent. He loved hearths and wrote that since man discovered fire, the hearth has been the center of their lives. At first, he scouted out locations to shoot where all he had to do was supply models drawn from his colorists in period dress. St. Johnsbury, Vermont on the left, Bennington, Vermont on the right, lining up a stagecoach for the shot. It's almost like filmmaking. Some photos didn't pay their way in sales. Many did. He staged period dramas convincing enough to feel like time travel of being there in ways few, if any, museums yet did. His great passion was furniture of the pilgrim century. Not sure where all these photos were taken. This is a house he came to own in Saugus, Mass. on the left. Some of the colonial interiors like this had a touch of Victorianism in the way 18th century objects were arranged. No 18th century interior ever quite looked like this with pewter decorating the overmantel. The chain of picture houses from an exhibition at the Webb Dean Stevens Museum in Wethersfield. In 1916, Nutting embarked on the formation of what he called his chain of picture houses, houses bought and furnished by Nutting on the eve of an antiques craze he helped spawn. Three years later, he had five furnished 17th and 18th century houses until World War I put an end to the emerging auto-based tourism revolution. The houses offered tours, school visits, and were curated and designed for making pictures that were widely advertised and wildly popular. Located in places like Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Newburyport, Mass., and Wethersfield, Connecticut, these are some of the most renowned historic houses in New England. The 1760 Wentworth Gardner House in Portsmouth almost wound up disassembled with parts installed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Most of his properties are active house museums today. His first house was named Hospitality Hall, opened on July 4th, 1916. The 1752 Joseph Webb House in Wethersfield now operated as a house museum by the Colonial Dames. The setting for a couple dozen interiors, all featuring Marriott's hooked rugs. All this time, he is simultaneously tapping an emerging antiques market centered in Hartford and elsewhere to acquire furnishings. No one had yet done it on this scale. Where the money came from is mysterious. Today at the Webb Dean Stevens Museum, the original murals commissioned from Hartford mural artists have been uncovered and restored after about 70 years when they were covered in wallpaper. 
The murals evoked the Battle of Yorktown and the famous meeting of Washington and Rochambeau in this house the spring before the final battle of the American Revolution. Always the marketeer, the North Parlor murals depict Nutting's chain of picture houses. Wallace Nutting Windsor's. He'd only recently begun collecting and studying antiques when he commenced writing books about them, this being his first from 1918. Harvard Business School could use Nutting as a case study to teach the concept of line extensions with divisions that amplify one another. The next move was the State's Beautiful series, which he began with Vermont in 1918. His photo safaris and search for antiques at the dawn of the auto age amounted to a book's worth of chapters, pictures, and places to write about. The books eventually took the Nuttings to Europe in their fancy Stevens Durier, a popular car manufacturer located in the tech hub of Chicopee, outside of Springfield, Mass. It's hard to wrap one's mind around the growing reach and influence Nutting had in the 1920s. In 1924, the revised edition of Nutting's Furniture of the Pilgrim Century became the most comprehensive survey of early American furniture of any period up to that time. Four years later, he published his famous two-volume furniture treasury, the best-selling of the hundreds of books published on American antiques. Pioneering photography, museum making, travel books, and antiques, no one before or since has ever combined so many facets of the American heritage and preservation enterprise. He was indeed a whole movement in one man. The books on furniture were widely advertised and became the Bible for a, a generation of collectors like John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and Henry DuPont at Winterthur. The books don't immediately seem related, but clearly travel books were byproducts of his work as a photographer, antiques collector, and sales agent for Nutting Inc. The antiques press, a kind of fourth estate for the industry, also emerged at the time. Nutting contributed articles. Nutting's next move was expanding into manufacturing reproductions of furniture and iron. He also developed a busy schedule of public talks on early American homes and furnishings, colonial furniture, and the state's beautiful. Despite the image of hand crafts craftsmanship, Nutting's furniture operations were in a factory and used some modern machinery. His published price lists for furniture and iron Numerous catalogs of nutting products. Uh, these are a pilgrim chair and a desk and bookcase, a reproduction of a Towns and, and Goddard desk from Newport. Chairs were both labeled and branded. His Windsor chairs were extremely popular. Modern forms, he even got into modern forms and adaptations that he colonialized. Then there was early ironwork, a book and reproductions of iron shown here and installed in the Wadsworth Athenaeum collection. Uh, there were also retail sales networks. The web house sale through Wanamakers in 1918 came about because World War I put an end to the tourism business and he quickly got out of it. It was quite likely a money loser anyway. Uh, it, he became an interior design consultant uh, with dozens of commissions. This is the was the Fuller family in Suffield, Connecticut, that commissioned him to furnish a room. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg, when they were building the Virginia Capitol, hired him to provide chairs for one of the meeting rooms. The insurance company in Hartford hired Nutting to furnish a boardroom. He. Bought and sold antiques. Here are Connecticut Valley doorways, both from Hatfield, Massachusetts. One is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and the other is at State Street Bank in Boston. Too bad they didn't stay in Hatfield. Uh, the Wallace Nutting Collection, uh, uh, which he had built and illustrated in his books, came to Hartford in 1924. The, this shows the group of individuals responsible for that path-breaking acquisition. Henry Wood Irving, Wallace Nutting, J.P. Morgan II, and William B. Goodwin, who was Morgan's cousin and the curator of colonial arts at the Athenaeum and connoisseur and collector in his own right. Opening night on February 6th, 1925, was the best attended event in the museum's history up to that point.
The, the collection arrived in November. They spent about three or four months installing it. And this list of the trustees, Henry Robinson, Arthur Shipman, George Dudley Seymour, J.P. Morgan, Charles Gross, Morgan Brainerd, antique collector, a, a board network second to none. It opened three months after the American wing at the Met, making it the second mecca for early American decorative arts. These are pictures of the installation as it looked in 1925. Uh, there was a walnut room, an oak room, a church room. The collection was reinstalled in 1934 in the then-new Avery building. And in the 1950s, Henry Maynard, former curator at Wadsworth Athenaeum, reinstalled it again. So it's had multiple lives. Then in 1984, uh, I was involved in the uh, largest installation of the collection up to that point, uh, the American Galleries uh, opened that year and uh, were award-winning and something I'm proud of. Uh, there was an article in Antiques Magazine that I wrote to s publicize a collection. Uh, there were lots of, there are lots of ways of displaying these things and lots of ways of thinking about them. We o opened with a chair chronology. There were sections with tables, beds, chairs, and painted chests. Uh, valuable boxes and Connecticut Valley regional furniture. I love the section on kitchen wares and early 18th century chairs. In 1989, uh, we did a off-site exhibition titled Wallace Not in a Search for New England's Past, where we were able to bring reproductions and photographs together in a way that the Athenaeum's collection really couldn't do the same way. In uh, 2004, former curator Tom Denenberg organized a major exhibition titled Wallace Nutting and the Invention of Old America. In 2016, Charles Lyle at the Webning Stevens Museum organized the Wallace Nutting Centennial Exhibition, 100th anniversary of the, his acquisition of the Joseph Webb House. Uh, the collection itself is worth a close look. It, there's amazing stuff. Uh, the enduring legacy of it, of the Pilgrim Century. And on the right there is a chair from Middleborough, Massachusetts from the 1680s. Uh, treasure from the famous book of the Pilgrim Century. Uh, the uh, Thomas Prince, Governor Thomas Prince Court Cupboard. He was the 4th, 8th, and 12th governor of the Plymouth Colony. Turkey work chair on the left, or Connecticut wainscot chair turned into a tape loom on the right. Chamber table and chest of drawer, drawers from Salem, Massachusetts. These are all products of the joiner's shop, uh, 17th century furniture. This cabinet from Boston is one of the earliest pieces of American furniture that uses imported exotic woods from the West Indies. The Fuller Cradle, shown here, was actually one of the most famous objects in his collection. It was exhibited at the, at the Centennial Celebration in Philadelphia in 1876. He later acquired it. There were chests. This masterpiece of painted furniture from Saybrook, Connecticut, by Charles Gillum. Uh, turned furniture, the Turner's Art, very important in the 17th century. Uh, the... Nutting Collection contains two communion tables, one of the rarest 17th century furniture forms. This Boston Square table, uh, extremely rare. There may be three or four of these known. Uh, William and Mary style caned and upholstered chairs shown here. Tea tables, uh, the, the form was invented in this period, about 1705, 1710, and upholstered chairs in the so-called William and Mary style tea tables and a drop leaf table, just they're wonderful forms. And then these uh, Dutch uh, style spoon racks are, are all part of this nutting collection. During the depression, the 1930s, things were hard. Sales from the reproduction tapered off. Nutting wrote an autobiography that year that is pithy and filled with revealing information about his life and times. He divided the chapters into what he called adventures. There were adventures in search of beauty, adventures with old houses, 
and a dozen other adventure stories. By the late 20s, Wallace Knight had arguably become one of the hundred most famous Americans. In, in, in the chapter titled Adventures in Matrimony, he talks about his wife, Marriott, who was a partner and travel companion in all his enterprises and may have been the source of the wealth that enabled him to take risks and embark on new enterprises. Uh, they spent most of their adult life in Framingham, Massachusetts, uh, in this mansion that for two colonialists, they actually preferred to live large in a big Victorian house. Uh, her gardens were impressive. Nadine finally died at the age of 71 in 1941 with World War II surging in Europe and just weeks before Pearl Harbor. In his writings, Nutting referred to the horror and savagery of the 20th century and missed the worst part of it. Wallace Nutting was a man in sync with his times who helped define them. Calvin Coolidge was president at the height of the Nutting era. Norman Rockwell was rising. It was a stricter culture in which respect for our, our national journey was secular gospel. I won't digress into the raging political debates of re recent years more than to say that history, that the history and heritage world has changed. It's long past time we have a serious conversation about this, a conversation where viewpoint diversity is emphasized. Americanism, not an era was an era when public policy emphasized assimilation and restricted immigration after the torrent of the late Gilded Age until World War I. Nutting was of his time. He helped shape it. There are 101 reasons to cherish this story, one being how deeply intertwined it is with the history and characters of Hartford, Connecticut, the place I was drawn to decades ago. The layers of the Hartford Onion are deeper than anyone could fully explore in just one lifetime. It wouldn't be the first time Hartford and the Connecticut Valley helped shape national life and values. It has been my great personal joy to be one of the stewards of this story and the great collection that brought me to it. Enjoy.